1 Corinthians 9 verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. May God bless his word to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the reminder that we are to run this race that you call life. We are to run it faithfully and we are to be your disciples. And we ask that as we look at your word and look at this definition of what a disciple is, that you would open our hearts to understand and to put into practice what we hear. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you who are visiting us today, we have just begun a journey, a 40-day devotional journey through a season that is commonly called Lent. Uh, and we are looking at a devotional called the Disciples Path. And that journey will take us 40 days into Holy Week prior to the resurrection of our Lord. And we are going to be learning a number of things on this journey of what it is to be a disciple. And so the first thing that we want to say today and the first theme that we want to tackle as we embark on this journey that started in the middle of this past week is really define what discipleship is by way of introduction. Bill Hybels uh, from Willow Creek coined a phrase some years ago called divine discontent or holy discontent. And he really spoke about that more in terms of a discontent that arises in our hearts when something is not as it ought to be. And it forces us to do something about it. And he was speaking specifically about some of the plights in our world like poverty and HIV AIDS and human trafficking and so on. And was challenging the listeners whether there was that, that restlessness, that discontent within your heart that made you want to go and do something about these evils in the world. As I thought about this, what struck me is that perhaps the greatest holy discontent ought to be about our own soul, our own spirituality. How are our lives being transformed into Christ-likeness? The psalmist wrote in Psalm 42, 1, as a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants after you, O God. Can you honestly say that this morning? Can you honestly this morning say that as a deer pants for streams of water, your soul pants after God? Jesus said to his first disciples, come follow me. But how do we do that? And this was the question that was posed by Benjamin Ingham in 1734 to John Wesley when he met him at Oxford University. How they could develop a systematic pattern for what they called the holy life. How could they live a life that was holy and godly? And so began the Methodist movement where Wesley proposed a number of spiritual disciplines needed to live a godly life. And my prayer is that over the next 40 days, for those of you who are on this journey, that you will reclaim some of these Wesleyan methods by which 
you can become a true disciple of Jesus and in turn go and make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. James Harnish suggests some key questions that every committed Christ follower should ask, and they're in your notes if you have notes with you. How do we move from making members for the church to making disciples of Christ? And as wonderful as it was this morning to welcome so many folk into the life of our church, it really isn't about making members. It's about making disciples. Secondly, how do we engage in the essential practices that enable us to grow into the likeness of Christ and become a part of God's transformation of the world? And thirdly, how do we grow as disciples of Christ and discover our unique gifts and become engaged in transforming ministry, both within and beyond the walls of our church? Those are key questions. Many years ago, Stephen Covey wrote what is still regarded by many as one of the most influential books of the 20th century. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, in which he lists the second habit as that of beginning with the end in mind. And as we embark on this disciple's path, we need to do that. We need to begin with the end in mind. It reminds me of the story that I'm sure many of us watched as children, Alice in Wonderland. Alice's conversation with the Cheshire cat during her journey through Wonderland. And when she came to a fork in the road, she asked, would you please tell me which way I ought to go from here? And the cat replied, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. And she said, I don't much care where. And the cat then replied, then it doesn't matter which way you go. When we know where we are going, it makes a big difference on how we're going to get there. And I guess we often feel like Thomas did, who came to Jesus and said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus then answered him and said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. In other words, if you follow me, if you seek me, you will know the way. You will understand the truth and you will experience the life. But you must follow me as my disciples. Beginning with the end in mind. So what is the end for you, friend? Even if you're a visitor here this morning, what is the end for you of this Christian journey? Where are you going? What do you want to accomplish? Where is this path taking you? What's your destination? How will you get from where you are now to where you want to be? And for those of you who are on this journey, where do you want to be in 40 days? Because if you don't really know what, you, what your destination is, if you don't really know what you want to be, you're not going to know how to get there. Now let me say that sadly... Churches across the world for decades have misled their people into believing that there are only two destinations in the Christian life. The first destination is heaven. As kids, you may have sung a little jingle that went something like this. Have you got a ticket on the heavenly train? Are you ready to meet the Lord? And it's great for kids to sing it. It's a great melody. But theologically, that song is so, so wrong and incorrect. Because the song is misleading in that it implies that becoming a Christian is all about getting your ticket to heaven. That the Christian life is all about being a contented passenger on a train that goes to heaven. 
And as you travel in the luxury and comfort of your carriage, you are oblivious to the poverty and the injustice and the destitution and the suffering that whizzes by you. And those who make up these churches believe that their primary goal is in fact to persuade outsiders to buy tickets for the train by accepting Jesus into their lives. And as important as that is for everyone to know Christ and to have an assurance of their salvation, the danger is that it becomes the end goal. And many make a decision for Christ but never become disciples of Christ. Their lives don't change. They stay the same as they ever were. And they have the audacity to tell everyone that they're going to heaven. Well, Jesus actually said some very solemn words in Matthew. He said, many will come before me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do this in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and heal the sick in your name? And the Lord will say, depart from me, I never knew you. But Lord, I, I thought I bought my ticket when I was at confirmation or whenever it was. And the Lord will say, sorry, I never knew you. Why? Because you made a decision, but you never became a disciple. It's not about heaven, friends. It's not an insurance policy against hell that you accept Jesus into your life. And the church has made that mistake over and over again. And we haven't focused on discipleship. The second destination that is erroneously taught is that becoming a Christian is all about health, wealth, and happiness. Nowhere in Scripture are these ever suggested as the goals of the Christian life. Sadly, the prosperity gospel is one that has overtaken the church, not only in our country, but right across the world. And rather than teaching about true discipleship, they teach a consumeristic gospel that is based on what you can gain and what you can get if you only follow Jesus. And we fall into the seductive trap of making our own health, wealth, and happiness the goal of the Christian life. And so we become like those childhood playmates you remember who played with you. Not because they were your friends, but because they wanted to play with your toys. And so we become Christians because we want, to, we want health and wealth and happiness. And that sadly is the message from pulpits around the world, is that's what you're going to get. And it's no wonder hundreds, if not thousands, are leaving the church disgruntled, disappointed, disillusioned, because the promises that have been made are just not a reality. They remain poor. They remain in broken homes and so on. And yet, they've come to the church. We desire friendship with God, not for who God is, but for what God can do for us. And so our faith becomes selfish and manipulative. Jesus spoke about the goal of discipleship in very different terms. A teacher of the law asked him, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You see, therein is the, the error of the question. What must I do to get to heaven? Jesus says, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And the expert in the law, knowing the law, answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And your neighbor is yourself. And Jesus said, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And only when you do that, then you shall live and have eternal life. Not simply making a decision for Jesus. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, let love be your highest goal. 
Go after a life of love as if your life depended on it because it does. Go after a life of love as if your life depended on it. John Wesley used the term Christian perfection. And all those who are standing up here this morning would be able to explain to you what Christian perfection is. We did it in our course. That is the destination of a life that's completely aligned with the love of God. And he says, and I quote, And a Christian believer, love sits upon the throne which is erected in the innermost soul, namely love of God and man, which fills the whole heart and reigns without a rival. Love that fills the whole heart and reigns without a rival. In other words, there's none other that you love more than God. So what does a disciple look like in the Wesleyan tradition? James Arnish, as we, you would have seen in your devotionals this week, defines a disciple as someone who is a follower of Jesus, whose life is centering on loving God and loving others. Notice the word there is centering as opposed to centered. It's not a life that is centered on loving God. It is centering, which speaks of an ongoing transformation by the grace of God. The destination of every disciple's path is a life in which the love of God that became flesh among us becomes flesh in us. It's what Friedrich Nitzke called a long obedience in the same direction. That's what discipleship is. A long obedience in the same direction. So what is a disciple? Someone who's centering on loving God and loving others. But the next question, which is as important, is how do we become disciples? How do we make progress on the disciples path and this is a question we could explore for the next five weeks we're going to look at five disciplines or habits that you can cultivate that will help you to make progress in your christian life we're going to look at prayer number one and studying god's word presence gifts service and witness prayer presence gifts service witness. These are the habits that create space for God to transform our hearts from hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. Now let me just say something that is really crucial here. And it's a very solemn caution. There's a danger as we seek to make these disciplines a part of our everyday life. That these disciplines of prayer and gifts and service become destinations and not disciplines along our journey toward Christ-likeness. You see, progress in the Christian life by many are regarded, is, is regarded by answering questions like, how much time are you spending in prayer? How many chapters of the Bible do you read a week? How many courses have you done in your church? How much do you give to God? How often do you come to church? How regularly do you meet in a small group or a life group, cell group, whatever you call it? All of those things are obviously important. I would never suggest otherwise. However, friends, we dare not become like the Pharisees in the New Testament where the practice of those things becomes an end in itself and our faith degenerates into an empty legalism that denies the love and the grace of God that Jesus came to proclaim. 
Jesus told a parable in Luke 18. Two men went up to a temple to pray, one Pharisee and another a tax collector. Tax collector is pretty much saying a sinner. And the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like all these other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. How many people in churches today say the same thing? I thank you, Lord, that I come to church three times on a Sunday. I thank you, Lord, that I tithe so much to the church. I thank you, Lord, that I give to mission. I thank you, Lord, that I read my Bible every day and I pray every day and I give to the poor. I thank you, Lord, I'm not like so many others in this church who are so uncommitted. And Jesus has very scathing words to say about the Pharisees. Not because those things in themselves were bad, but he warns them against believing that they are making spiritual progress merely by faithfulness to certain spiritual disciplines. Ticking the box, I pray every day, I read my Bible every day, I go to church once a week, I'm in a life group, and because of that I'm being transformed into Christ's likeness. Friends, that is the lie of Satan. You do not become transformed by simply doing those things. It's a journey. It's not trying to do a whole lot of things to become more holy. It's a process. It's a journey. Let me try and explain this a little more clearly. John Ortberg makes an important distinction between training and trying. Our practice of these spiritual disciplines is about training, not trying. Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, have nothing to do with godless myths, but train yourself to be godly. You don't become godly by sitting back and saying, Lord, make me godly. Nor do you become godly by simply trying to be. Virgil, who was up here giving the notices, runs comrades every year, as do some others in the church. But let's just say his goal this year is to run comrades and to get a silver medal. So how is he going to go about doing that? Well, what he won't do is simply fill in an application form and send it in. Disregard all the requirements of qualifying times and that in a marathon in order to compete. Or simply just turn up to the comrades at the starting line and try his best to finish the race. No, he'll do what Paul tells us to do in 1 Corinthians 9. Everyone who competes goes into strict training. So what will he do? He'll get up early in the morning to run extra kilometers for the race. He will start eating various foods and supplements that will strengthen him and give him the stamina to endure through the race. He'll make sure that he gets enough sleep and so on. In other words, he won't just try and finish the race. He will train for the race. There's a huge difference, friends, between trying and training to be godly. We know from our definition of discipleship that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. But practically, how does that work? So you come here to church, and you hear a message that really speaks to you about, let's say, tolerance not being judgmental, not being critical, being gentle and understanding and all of that. And you go away really feeling that you have been spoken to. God has spoken to you. You've got to change. You've got to be more understanding of people, more tolerant. So you go home determined that you're going to be. You're going to try your best. And you go to work on Monday and you're determined not to be overly critical of anything around you. And then later in the day, one of your suppliers really messes up or one of your clients or whatever happens 
and you find yourself in your boss's office bad mouthing them, saying we must kick them to touch, they're useless, they're hopeless, we must, you know, let them go, whatever it is. And as you're saying that, you suddenly remember, oh boy, I've just, I've just been really critical and, and I've bad mouthed them. Lord, I'm sorry. So you go home and you determine you're, not, you're going to try better the following day. And the following day something else happens and you find yourself doing the same thing. And it happens day after day after day, month after month, year after year. You're the same critical, judgmental person you were 20 years ago. So what happened to the growing in Christ-likeness? The problem is you're trying. You're not training. You're not training. Training is when you forget about trying to be Mr. Nice Guy and being so gentle and sensitive and humble and kind and not trying to judge anything or criticize anything around you, but rather training is when you get up half an hour earlier in the morning to spend more time in God's Word, to learn the disciplines that you need to in order to be the person He wants you to be. To spend time in prayer, committing your day to the Lord and praying the Lord's Prayer, Lord, Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil, because you know it's going to come. And then at the end of the day, reflecting on your day and saying, Lord, thank you for helping me. Thank you in that situation that I didn't lose my temper. Thank you, Lord, that when I wanted to criticize, I held my tongue and I didn't. Because, Lord, your spirit in me enabled me to do that. I wasn't just trying in the energy of the flesh to do it. It almost came naturally. And when you find you apply these disciplines, prayer, present, gift, service, witness, and you apply them in your life daily for three or so months, you find suddenly you're becoming more tolerant, less judgmental, less critical. And somehow the grace of God is, is working in and through you. And you suddenly start asking yourself things like, Gee, where did that come from? I've never said something like that before. I've never been so gentle and so kind and spoken a word and been so understanding before. I'll tell you where it came from. It wasn't a conscious thing. It came because you applied the disciplines of your faith. You didn't just try and be good. There's nothing in this Bible, friends, that says you must try and be a good Christian. It is nowhere in God's Word. In fact, Jesus said to a similar expert in the law, he said, no one is good except God. Because he came and said, good teacher. He said, there's no one good except God. So why are you trying to be good if there's no one good except God? You're on a losing, losing path all the way. You'll never be good. But you can... Apply those disciplines in order to grow in Christ-likeness. Someone has said that a spiritual discipline is any activity I can do by direct effort that will help me to do what I cannot now do by direct effort. Let me say that again. Any activity I can do by direct effort, pray, read my Bible, worship, all of those things, that will help me to do what I cannot now do by direct effort because right now I find myself not spending time in the Word and not praying and not worshipping and so on. So a spiritual discipline is to put those things in place so that you do it all the time, daily. And so I ask you, friends, as we bring this to a close, are you trying or are you training? Are you trying or are you training? Are you just engaged in religion or are you engaged in a relationship with the living God who by His Spirit is enabling you every day to become more like Him? Paul says we're going to strict training so that we might win the prize. What is the prize? I'll close with this verse, Romans 12 verse 2. This is the prize. Do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the goal. Of being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Being transformed into Christ-likeness. Being transformed to live a godly life.
to live a holy life. That is our goal. That is why we are encouraging you to make these things a part of your everyday life. Begin with the end in mind. So what is your end? Where do you want to be in 40 days? And I've said this, I don't know how many times from this pulpit, but I'm going to say it once more. In 40 days' time, are you going to be any more like Jesus than you are today? In 40 days' time, will you be any more like Christ than you are today? And if you've gone through a whole disciple's path and you've gone through all the lessons and devotions and everything and you can honestly in 40 days' time reflect and say, you know, I'm actually no more like Jesus today. And I'm sorry, friends. Then you're like a Pharisee who just goes through the motions, goes through the disciplines, and they become destinations in themselves rather than becoming stepping stones to becoming more like Jesus. Does that make sense? That is what it is to be a disciple. To love God with all your heart, soul, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. To let love reign in your heart with no other rival. That is what discipleship is. Does that mean you're going to be perfect every day? Absolutely not. Does that mean you're not going to lose your temper with a supplier or a client or whatever? Absolutely not. But you will find as you persevere in this journey that in time, that will become part of you. It will become natural to deal with things differently to the way you're dealing with them right now. I pray that we will journey. For those of you who haven't yet begun the journey, there are some books, I believe. Are there books at the back there? There are some books left over. If you haven't taken a book and you haven't got on the journey, you'll have to catch up a few days, but it's rather... Better starting the journey now than not starting at all. So do uh, take a book at the back. There is a, a cost. You can just contribute anything to 30 Rand for a book. But let's get on to the journey. And may this journey truly help us to become more like him. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that you call us to be disciples. You call us to be Christ-like now, we are so aware of many areas of our life where we are not. And we ask, Lord, that you would grow that love within us, a love for you and a love for our neighbor. And as we apply these disciplines, that they may not just become boxes to tick every day, but, Lord, that they will become those stepping stones to become more like you. And so encourage us, Lord, through your word a day. And may we truly be disciples who go and make disciples. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.